glory, glory, Lord. We give you glory, Lord. Glory, glory, Lord. You are the mighty God. You are the mighty God. Glory, glory, Lord. We give you glory, Lord. Glory, glory, Lord. You are the mighty God. You are the mighty God. You who go down to the sea. You who live in the islands. Oh, if you live in the city. Lift your voice and sing out. Sing out glory, glory, Lord. We give you glory, Lord. You are the mighty God. You are the mighty God. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing his praise to the ends of the earth. Let every nation tell it, declare it, till every man is heard. Sing out glory, glory, Lord. We give you glory, Lord. You are the mighty God. You are the mighty God. Nani nani Jehovah. No kadani Jehovah. Nani nani Jehovah. Keyaku amana loa. Vikia vikia le tua. Matote via o le tua. Be ea, be ea, le tua, o o le tu mata utia. Glory, glory, Lord. We give you glory, Lord. We give you glory, Lord. We give you glory, Lord. Glory, glory, Lord. You are the mighty God. You are the mighty God. Glory, glory, Lord. We give you glory, Lord. And he indeed is the mighty God. Well, hello. This is not Wednesday. Uh, this is actually Friday, but I've uh, kind of been under the gun and uh, finally getting around to do this uh, thoughts for the 45th Psalm. It's supposed to be the coldest day that we've had so far this fall and or winter uh, tonight. Don't know where you are, but in Sherman, Texas, it's going to get pretty cold for those of us who live in this area. But it's good, to, it's good to have you with us as we continue our journey through the Psalter with Psalm 45. And before we start today, uh, I just want to I want to ask you a question. If you're married, do you remember your wedding? I remember our wedding, and it was a nice wedding. It wasn't an extravagant wedding. It was really pretty traditional. Um, there I was in a black tuxedo. She had on her white wedding dress, her wedding gown. She had her court of bridesmaids, and I had my groomsmen. We did the wedding cake, we did the punch, we did the rice, we did the throwing of the bouquet and the garter and all that stuff. It was a typical church wedding, but I remember it. Sometimes there are some very special things, maybe one-of-a-kind things done at weddings, and, and that makes them special. What we're looking at today in Psalm 45 is not just a wedding, it's a royal wedding. It apparently is the king's wedding, which means that there is a, a royal wife that's going to be coming on the scene too. Um, a lot of things we don't know, but it is 
it fairly well represents what a royal wedding would be like if you could describe it in 17 verses. And that's what we have to work with here. And so as we look at this psalm, and we always share with how it kind of presents itself, how it divides itself to us, and really there's two major divisions, but there's also a prescript and a postscript. Verse 1 is the prescript, and verse 17 is the postscript. In between those two scripts, we have two sections, and that's it. We have, we have verses 2 through 9 that give for us the, the praise and the blessing on the king, on the king on his wedding day. You would think there'd be praise and blessing coming from the king, but no, this is his wedding day, so praise and blessing on the king on his wedding day. Then verses 10 through 14 are going to present to us the royal bride. Yes, verses 10 through, 10 through 16 will, will show us the praise uh, for the bride and her presentation to the royal groom. So it sounds like we really have a wedding going on here. And then ending with, with the postscript. And we'll read those in just a moment. And of course, we'll read the whole psalm. After we finish reading it, or as we're reading it, I would like for you to be, be thinking about what does it remind you of? I seriously doubt if it would be an exact reminder of your wedding. It's not mine, but I do remember our wedding. But there's something about it that reminds me of something else in the Bible, and we'll get to that. And then we will go on to ask, could it possibly, and of course if I'm asking the question, you know the answer is yes, could it possibly stand metaphorically for something else? And we'll talk about that too. So let's, uh, let us read it together, the 45th Psalm. Again, reading from my English Standard Version. And we have a superscript. It says, To the choir master, according to Lilies, a maskal of the sons of Korah, a love song. And it's definitely that. And so I don't know if this is something that would be sung during temple worship or not. But apparently it was, it was very well known. And so we begin. Now here's the prescript to all of this. My heart overflows with a pleasing theme. I address my verses to the king. My tongue is like the pen of a ready scribe. Okay, we'll stop here. I normally don't comment after one verse, but you see what's happening here. The Psalter, the, the one who's writing all this down, is saying, I'm, I'm about to be involved in something that's really special. And I feel like I'm writing a story. Just like the scribe would be using his pen to write. And so that's how, that's how the writer is feeling here. So he goes on to write. You are the most handsome of the sons of men. Grace is poured upon your lips. Therefore God has blessed you forever. Gird your sword on your thigh, O mighty one, in your splendor and majesty. In your majesty, write out victoriously for the cause of truth and meekness and righteousness. Let your right hand teach you awesome deeds. Your arrows are sharp. In the heart of the king's enemies, the people fall under you. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Your robes are all fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia. From ivory palaces, stringed instruments make you glad. Daughters of kings are among your ladies of honor. At your right hand, 
stands the queen in gold of Ophir. Hear, O daughter, and consider and incline your ear. Forget your people and your father's house, and the king will desire your beauty. Since he is your lord, bow to him. The people of Tyre will seek your favor with gifts, the richest of the people. All glorious is the princess in her chamber with robes interwoven with gold. In many colored robes, she is led to the king with her virgin companion, companions following behind her. With joy and gladness, they are led along and they enter the palace of the king. Now here's this. In, in place of your father shall be your sons, and you will make them princes in all the earth. And now comes the, the postscript. I will cause your name to be remembered in all generations. Therefore, nations will praise you forever and ever. Well, doesn't it just almost make you happy <laughs> to read that? Pleasant. Pleasant indeed. Okay, so we, we have the king and being recognized for virtually everything that he is and has done. It talks about him being victorious, having his sword on his, on his side, how handsome he is, how excited he is, and how he seems to be just waiting for the entrance of his bride. But other things are said about this king. He says, your arrows are sharp. In the heart of the king's enemies, the people fall under you. It says, in your majesty, ride out victorious for the cause of truth and meekness and righteousness. But here's the kicker, maybe. Beginning in verse 8, we have some scriptures that over in Hebrews chapter 1 are applied to Jesus. And thus my question that I mentioned that I asked earlier that we need to be thinking about. Is there something metaphorical here too? Maybe there's a double story being told. It does say that his kingdom, this kingdom, will last forever. In verse two, it's one of the one of the first things that said that said, "Therefore, God has blessed you forever." And I might take you here to the book of Exodus, verse thirty-four. I'm sorry, Second Samuel, uh, where God is positioning, you might say, might say Himself in the life of David, and He tells David through Nathan the prophet that that there will be a king after David and another one, another one, and your kingdom will last forever. And how did that happen? Well, who was the last son of David? Well, that was Jesus Christ. So maybe in more ways than one, this royal wedding psalm is really there using the descriptions of a royal wedding with the royal groom and the royal bride really telling us about Jesus. Jesus, our King. And does he not have a bride? Yes, he does. The bride is his church the bride of Christ and so we could we could go back through this and we could we could highlight we could pinpoint some descriptions here for in the first nine verses describing the king that would apply to Jesus and in the in the last eight verses some things that could describe the bride of Christ the church as well as the bride of a royal wedding. This is an interesting form that's used, I think, in the Old Testament a lot, where something is said that does have a literal meaning, but it also has a, has a metaphorical meaning, something behind it, something behind the literal meaning, 
something that we're supposed to take note of, and if we were a Jew, hold on to. Oh, they all knew how a royal wedding went. I asked you, did you can you think of one in the Bible? And the one I think of is, that's close to it is, is that of Esther, and particularly when it talks about the bride. But you know, Esther was chosen out of a bunch of women to become the the queen, the, the bride of the king, after Vashti uh, was gone. And you might remember there came a time when she had to present herself to the king without asking for that. And, and that could have cost her her life, but she was doing that in behalf of her people, the Jews, to make sure the king knew what old Haman had cooked up for the Jews who were of course Esther's people and it's talked it, you, it talks about her companions and and how she's dressed and it sounds just like this the only difference is that the bride of Christ has a king Jesus that's always available and we can go to him and go to God through him. And so as we as we maybe look a little more closely at this at this psalm, wow, what other lines might be descriptive of Jesus? How about uh, verse three? Gird your sword on your thigh, O mighty one, in your splendor and majesty. Well, yes, the king, the physical king, could be described that way. But if we had time, could we look at the book of Revelation and this sword? from the rider on the white horse that cuts going and coming and he's being victorious sure we could so you ride out victoriously verse 4 for the cause of truth and meekness and righteousness I'm not sure how many kings fought for all of that but I know a king who did and made that righteousness and that truth and that meekness available to us his resident servants residents of his kingdom your throne O God is forever from from here we know that this particular part of the passage is applied to Jesus by the writer of Hebrews and how how wonderful it is God has anointed you yes that's the word Messiah is it not God has anointed Jesus. He was the promised one, the Messiah, with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And, and so what, what could be described as a king, and similar to how the Queen of Sheba described Solomon's stuff, right? Saying, boy, the half, the half hadn't even been told me when she saw it for herself. And then the bride, the royal bride, Hear, O daughter, and consider and incline your ear. Forget your people and your father's house. Remember that? That was Esther. She was a Jew coming into a pagan royalty. And she really didn't forget her father's people or her father's house. As a matter of fact, she ended up saving them. But many times they did. And you might remember some of the kings of Israel and Judah who took foreign wives. And in the taking of those foreign wives, the kings kind of forgot some of the teachings of the law of Moses, and that reflect, that was reflected in the kingdom itself. And so we come as the bride of Christ today, and we have been given the teachings of Christ. We experience the love of Christ. We experience his salvation. And now he says, what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with what I've told you and what I've taught you? And he expects us to live in it and to share it with others. There's plenty of room for more residents in this kingdom. So the prescript says the writer's ready to write. And the postscript says, I'll cause your name to remember, be remembered in all generations, and therefore nations will praise you forever and ever. Well, of course, the, the Jews did praise David as king. 
But he didn't live forever. As a matter of fact, Peter's going to say when he's preaching there in Jerusalem, hey, we know where his grave is. But let me tell you about Jesus who's seated at the right hand of God. I think it's exciting that when you read the Old Testament that you look for, that you look for some of these pre-pictures of Jesus. I think they're all in there. And I think that's important. As a matter of fact, that's kind of where I am in our Sunday morning class, having just started last Sunday morning, uh, entitling the class, The Old Testament Speaks. And what I'm trying to share in the class is how the Old Testament speaks of Jesus. In the prophecies, yes, but in more than that. The example we looked at last Sunday, for example, well, Jesus is on the cross and, and hanging on the cross was not the beginning of his torture. It was, it was in the middle of it and at the end he had already been scourged and, the, and that scourging just brought blood and flesh and stuff all, uh, all over. He'd been without, he'd been without anything to drink and this had been for a while. He'd been standing in front of people and he's hanging on the cross and says, I thirst and they give him a drink that's wine mixed with something. And it appears from what we're told that the once he realized that it was wine, he spit it out and wouldn't drink it. Why is that? Well, if you go to the book of Leviticus, you will see where the high priest, when offering the sacrifice, the sacrifice every year, the Day of Atonement, neither he nor the other priests could have strong drink or wine. And now the high priest is hanging on the cross, becoming the sacrifice. No high priest ever did that. And so he would not take wine either. There's so many of those kinds of things in, in the Old Testament. And here we have one in front of us today in Psalm 95. A picture of, yes, a typical royal wedding, but also a pre-picture of Jesus Christ and his bride, the church and he and it will last forever until he comes. Well, have a great, uh, great day out there. Be careful, stay warm, and we will see you next week for Psalm 46. Glory, Lord, you are the mighty God.